Well, thank you very much, uh, Suzy, for the invitation to come here and talk about CAR, the Center for Accelerated Application Readiness. And this is the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facilities program to bring applications ready for its current and next generation supercomputers. And I happen to be uh, the group lead for scientific computing and this activity takes place in my group. Currently at the OLCF, the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, we have Titan, our 27 petaflop machine that is our current workhorse for the modeling and simulation applications that we support. But we are very excited about our next machine that we will get in the 2017-2018 timeframe, which will be named Summit, and I'll say a little bit more about that in the following slides. Uh, this is the Coral system. It's the collaboration between Oak Ridge, Argonne, and Livermore in the procurement of the next generation supercomputers for those three facilities. And those three facilities are all DOE facilities. And of course, we treat this as our pre exascale machine. Our expectation is that the generation after Summit will be the first exascale machine that we will uh, house in the OLCF. So our current system, it's a Cray NVIDIA uh, machine with uh, a little bit over 18,000 nodes. Each of these nodes consists of a CPU and a GPU. The GPU is the accelerator. Uh, the CPU is the AMD Opteron. The NVIDIA Kepler is our accelerator on this system. Uh, the accelerators are on a PCI Express bus, and we'll get to this a little bit later again. The interconnect is a proprietary Cray Gemini interconnect. We have, in total, 688 terabytes of memory on this machine. And as I said, the peak, peak flop rate is 27 petaflops. We have a number of other systems that we use for pre and post processing in our data center to support needs of our user programs. But that's not the subject of this presentation. But we're really, really excited about Summit. Uh, Summit is going to be our next machine. It will be an IBM, NVIDIA, Mellanox uh, partnership that is going to build this machine. It will have in the order of 3,400 nodes, so significantly fewer than on our current Titan system. It will have IBM Power9 CPUs on each node, multiple ones, and multiple NVIDIA Tesla GPUs as the accelerators. What is different in this architecture is that through NVLink, there is this a uh, unified memory over the entire node. So both GPU and CPUs will be using the same memory space. It's a large coherent memory of over a terabyte of memory per node. It's all directly addressable by the CPU and the GPU. And in addition, what is new is this 800 gigabytes of NVRAM on each node that can be used for but in, in different ways. It can be a burst buffer for I.O., or it could be storage of data that particular applications need to use. The node performance will be in the order of 40 teraflop per node. This is a significant increase over what we have currently on Titan. The interconnect, the system interconnect, will be the dual rail Mellanox EDR interconnect, and we'll get the IBM elastic storage, which commonly is known as GPVS uh, file system. So here's a comparison between what we currently have with Titan and how that is going to change on the way to Summit. So the application performance between Summit and Titan, on Summit it'll be five to 10 times faster than on Titan currently. Our node count is going to be significantly down from what we currently have. And our application programmers are really very excited about this. This is one of the aspects of the new machine that, that they're really looking forward to. These are going to be extremely fat nodes. We're going to go from 1.4 to about 40 teraflops of performance per node. The memory will increase significantly. And this is one of the other aspects uh, that makes this machine really attractive to a lot of our applications. 
and that is that it goes from around 38 gigabytes per node to over a terabyte per node. NVRAM I already mentioned. Um, the node interconnect is currently on Titan probably the largest bottleneck. It's a very thin straw through which we need to push all the data from the node to the accelerator and back. And that is going to be a lot different with NVLink and having a unified memory for both the CPUs and the accelerators. Our system interconnect is going to go from Gemini to the Mellanox uh, dual rail EDR. We'll go from a 3D torus configuration to a full non-blocking fat tree. And I already talked about the processors in the file system. What is really interesting is that even though our performance is going to go up five to tenfold, the peak power consumption of this machine is only going to increase by about 10%, from nine to 10 megawatts. So how are we going to make applications ready for this new architecture? This was, of course, a, different, uh, a difficult thing to do when we went to a hybrid system uh, with, with Titan, but the architecture is going to significantly change compared to Titan when we go to Summit that we still need to work with our application developers uh, to get their applications ready. And this is what we call our Center for Application Readiness, or Center for Accelerated Application Readiness. And we have a number of goals for this program. Uh, porting and optimizing applications for the next, next architecture. We want to have new codes on that architecture with which we can attract new users to our user program that can effectively use this new architecture. But we also want to gain experience early on so that with the experience that we have, we can help other users and other developers also be successful on that system once it's on the floor. Since this is a brand new system and a lot of components still need to be developed by the vendors, uh, a lot of the tools may be immature, uh, especially early on. And so what we can do with these uh, car applications is to test both the software development environment as well as the hardware itself. So we also use these this programs with large-scale uh, science runs to uh, identify any remaining stability problems that may exist on the machine. And so this is an example of what we did for Titan. This is um, a run that we did twice on Titan once only on the CPU and once only on the GPU, identical run, using a material science co uh, code called LSMS. And the red curve is the instantaneous power usage for this run. And you can see on the, on the horizontal axis the time that it took to complete this run. It's uh, three and a half hours or so. And you see the total amount of energy used during this process doing the exact same run, now also using the GPU, so this is after all the effort we put in to port this application to be able to use the GPUs. You see the blue curve over there. Of course, the instantaneous power that is being used goes up because now we have to fire up these GPUs, but the time to solution is so much shorter that the runtime is eight and a half times faster than before. So this is what the scientist is interested in. But the data center is very much interested in how much power this has, has cost. And the energy consumption is a factor of seven less between using only the CPUs and using the CPUs and the GPUs. So what are we going to do in preparation for Summit? Well, we're extending this Center for Accelerated Application Readiness program. We learned quite a few things from doing this for Titan. And so uh, the process by which we do this is a little bit different from what we did before. Uh, we recognize that it is extremely important to get the application developers themselves involved in this process. They know the code best. They can make sure anything we do to the code gets back into the repository. And they're also doing the moving on this moving part. Uh, it's being continuously developed. If they are doing the development, we'd like to move with them so that we're not working on a stale version of the application. It's crucial to have the vendor involved as well. This is 
architecture, uh, this is hardware that is still being developed, this is software development environments that are still being developed. In this process leading up to Summit, we need to have these vendors involved because they can help us with the tools that we will have available and that are constantly changing during that time. To get really the application developers interested in working with us, and this is a, this is a tremendous task, um, we will have at the end of this whole program an early science phase where we have a significant uh, amount of resources available to them to do a science run, a challenging uh, scientific campaign. And so this is the carrot with which we uh, hope to attract uh, these applications to go work with us. We'll have access to multiple resources on the way. Uh, Summit is going to be delivered in 2017, so that's not available between now and then. But we will have early development and test systems available from IBM, first with the Power 8 and with the Power 8 Plus and then the Power 9, and also with the accelerators, currently the Tesla, uh, Kepler's, the, um, the Pascal, and then finally the, the Voltas. Portability is a big concern, and I have another slide after this, and my friends here from uh, NERSC and the ALCF will uh, talk about this as well. Uh, portability is really important to our sponsor, and so we have a number of joint activities, uh, joint training, and, and joint uh, uh, development activities planned. Again, the experience that we get from this whole process will help others uh, once the machine is on the floor. And we really want to develop this persistent culture within our centers of application readiness. So this is not a one-time thing that we do with a number of projects, a, a number of application codes. We want to continue this. And the metric for success is really the um, uh, what we call the computational readiness that's one of the criteria for the largest user program that we support within the leadership computing facilities. So that is ALCF and OLCF. If you want to have a project within the uh, inside program, as this is called, your project will go through uh, two reviews, a merit review, but also a computational readiness review. And so the the applications that we pick for this program will have to, at the end, be able to get through that computational readiness review. <clears throat> um, we see two tracks on the way to Exascale currently. One is the many core track, and my friends will uh, talk about Cori and they will talk about Aurora, which are in that track. We are in the hybrid multi-core track with Summit. And I just went through the uh, set of uh, uh, characteristics that I can mention for Summit. So why is architecture and performance portability important? Uh, it's important to our sponsor, but not because they think, no, in itself it's important. It's important because of a number of reasons. Application developers don't want to target just one particular architecture that may be there for four or five years and then there's something else and they have to redo it. Maintaining multiple code bases, that's another alternative, is very cumbersome. And so it's very labor intensive, very expensive to do. Porting to different architectures all the time, a new one comes, is very time consuming. Many of our PIs have projects that run on multiple architectures. We have, I think, about 10 uh, projects within the inside program right now that have time both on the ALCF facility as well as on the OLCF facility with two completely different architectures. We'd like to make it easy for them to seamlessly go from one to the other and back. And then finally, applications always outlive the architecture on which they currently run. Uh, most uh, large modeling and simulation codes have been around for 10, 20 years. Well, machines don't stick around for all that long. A lot of the work that needs to be done on these applications will be very similar, uh, irrespective of what particular architecture you eventually will run it on. 
you need to be looking at uh, optimizations that improve the performance on any architecture. You need to expose fine-grained parallelism before you start ma mapping that onto your particular architecture. And data locality, <coughs> uh, uh, avoiding data movement as much as you can is helpful on any architecture that you're targeting. And we have a number of strategies that could be helpful in getting portability of these codes. And um, some of them are mentioned here using portable libraries, for example. This is actually very, uh, a very interesting um, uh, uh, aspect. In our call for proposals for the CAR projects, we asked the, uh, the PIs to tell us um, their view on portability. And more than once, the answer was, well, my code is very portable because I don't use anybody's libraries. So the concept of using portable libraries that may exist on a variety of architectures already that have been optimized for that architecture that would make your application performance portable between one architecture and another. They didn't think about that. So oftentimes you, you get this response. And there are a number of other things that we are doing to, uh, to look at uh, performance portability. So all three OSCAR facilities, NERSC, ALCF, and OLCF, have an application readiness program. NERSC is called NESAP, and Katie will talk about that. Uh, we just announced uh, our CAR uh, program, or we, we, we made the decisions on our CAR program. And then the uh, early science program at the ALCF is what Tim will be talking about. There's a lot of synergy between these, these uh, three programs. They're not identical, they're slightly different. Uh, NERSC's user base is a little bit different from ours. Um, and so the, our architecture is different from the architecture at the ALCF, so our users are a little bit different in some cases. But we have a lot of synergy between these, and portability is one thing that we all are worried about. So with that, I, this is the first time I'm publicly announcing the winners of our CAR applications. So we had a call for proposals, and this is the list. I won't go through the list because for each of these, I have a single slide that briefly explains what these applications are doing. And so um, the first one is ACME. This is a climate simulation code. Uh, this is led by David Bader from uh, uh, Livermore. Um, this is a code that uh, they will pour to, want to pour to Summit, and in particular they want to use on the climate grid, on each grid point, they want to do a cloud resolving model on each of these grid points. So between these different cloud resolving models that are very computationally intensive, there is relatively little communication, and so this is a perfect candidate for doing things in a massively parallel way. So this is what the ACME team we'll start working on. The second code is Dirac. Dirac is a relativistic electronic structure code. This project will be led by uh, Luke Fisser from the University of Amsterdam, actually the Free University of Amsterdam. There are two there. Um, this code is specifically targeting materials that have very heavy metals or very heavy elements in them where relativistic effects are very important. For example, the color of gold is yellow, and that's because of relativistic effects. If you would do a non-relativistic uh, evaluation of the energy states within gold, they would be such that it would look like silver. But because of the fact that the electrons very close to the nucleus have a speed, of, a speed that approaches half the speed of light, relativistic effects are very important. That tends to decrease the size of the orbitals. Because of that, it is shielding the, the positive nucleus, and so the outer shells are actually getting a little bit wider. And as a result, the energy difference between those is also changing. And that is, bec and that is making gold yellow instead of uh, silver color. Flash. Flash is an uh, adaptive mesh refinement environment 
with a number of applications, but it is primarily targeting um, astrophysics simulations. Uh, Bronson Messer, who happens to be one of the uh, members in my group, is the PI on this project. And they will specifically be looking at the, what they call the burn module within FLASH. So this is where the, the uh, nuclear reactions are modeled that happen in exploding supernovae. The next one is GTC. This is a plasma fusion, uh, plasma physics code. Um, Zihong Lin from the University of California at Irvine is the PI on this project. This is a project looking at um, plasmas in a uh, magnetically confined uh, um, area. And he is particularly interested in looking at the stability of the plasma within such an environment. Uh, this is a code that already has been uh, working very well on our uh, GPUs, and so this is a very good candidate for Summit. HACK is a cosmology code. This code is modeling the dark matter in the universe. And of course, dark matter is dark, so you don't see it. Um, so you need to be looking at the things that you do see to see what the influence is of the dark matter. So he is now going to include within HACK the possibility of including baryonic matter, which means that you can actually see it, so you can see what the dark matter influence is on, uh, on what we see when we observe the universe. Alice Dalton is another electronic structure code. This project is led by Dr. Paul Jorgensen from Aarhus University in Denmark. Uh, he currently has a inside project with us on, on Titan. This is a code that is targeting very large systems with a method that formally scales as n to the seventh. But because of the way in which he is partitioning his calculations, it becomes linear in the size of the system, even though each individual piece is still n to the seventh. And so this opens up the, the opportunity to look at systems that are things like nanowires or, or uh, biomaterials. The th next one is NAMD. This is a molecular dynamics code that is primarily used for biophysical simulations. And uh, Dr. Klaus Schulten from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is the PI on this project. And this is already a code that is uh, running very well on GPUs. And so this is, again, a very good candidate for running on Summit. Nucor is a uh, nuclear coupled cluster code that was developed at Oak Ridge. So now you know what Nucor stands for. Um, so this is in the area of nuclear physics. Uh, Gauda Hagen from Oak Ridge is the PI on this project. And they will be taking this code and porting it to the GPUs. Next one is NWCHEM. NWCHEM is another computational chemistry code with a large number of modules within that code. Uh, Carol Kowalski, the PI from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, uh, will be the PI on this project. And they will be focusing on the coupled cluster code within NWCHEM, which is specifically targeting excited uh, states for systems so that you can look at the capture of photons and um, do a good description of these photovoltaic materials. That, that is his area of interest. Very computational intensive. QMCPAC is a material science code based on Quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, Paul Kent from Oak Ridge is the PI. And this is already running on our GPUs, but not as well as it could be, so uh, there's a lot of work there to be done still. Uh, and this, was, uh, this is one of our uh, car projects. Oops, that's the wrong way. Raptor. Uh, Raptor is a code for combustion, um, uh, turbulent combustion. That the specific detail of this code is that it is combustion that is in a very specific environment. So it's, it's both a combustion code and an engineering code. 
So you can look at combustion processes in engines, for example. And uh, Joe Ophelein from Sandia is the PI on this project. Spec FEM is a seismic code led by Jeroen Tromp from Princeton. Uh, this is, uh, they, they're doing a lot of simulations and then compare that with measured seismographs from uh, earthquakes to get a good model for the uh, vibrations in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the earth crust. And then finally, XGC is another uh, fusion code. The objective here is to do a full ether type uh, simulation. And they're specifically interested in what happens at the boundaries of this plasma, and in particular what is called the diverter, which is the, at the bottom of this tokamak, where a lot of the material that is being generated uh, during this fusion process uh, end up. So there's a lot of skill that needs to go into these uh, projects. And the scientific computing team, this is the team, uh, a picture from a few months ago. We lost, unfortunately, a few people. Um, but these are the highly skilled computational domain scientists that also have a lot of experience in running things and developing uh, applications on Titan. And so these are the ones that are going to partner together with the vendors with these uh, application teams. And with that, I'll open it up for questions.